September 1991, a new Russian Navy aircraft is landing vertically on the deck of the Admiral Grushkov aircraft carrier. Yukolev Design Bureau went all in for one last attempt to try and get back its old glory days of the Soviet Union. A new design that held 12 world records all the way from the prototype to its completed construction, but was doomed to fail from the start. Today we'll be talking about the aircraft that probably inspired the Lockheed and American engineers when designing the vertical F-35 and how its impact on Russian aviation is still felt today. This is Yak-141. Let's be clear, the Soviet Navy was never as good as the US one. The Soviets had a different doctrine, centered around hunting US aircraft carrier groups and delivering nuclear payloads to them via submarines from distant polar regions. Thus, their naval aviation was, well as you can guess, so far behind the US that the Russian Navy would be decimated in a toe-to-toe -to -toe conflict. So in the early 1980s, they decided to change that. The Yak-38 was the main naval aircraft of the Soviet Navy and Kiev-class aircraft carriers, or should I say heavy aircraft cruisers per Soviet classification. Even in the words of Yukolev, it was always meant to be an interim solution. The construction and design of the Yak-38 was only meant to be a study to develop technologies and production for a more capable naval jet. So that time had come by 1975. The Yukolev Bureau got one simple task, make a new jet that would be able to defend the fleet from enemy aircraft. The simple part wasn't so simple, of course, because they wanted a real fighter this time that could outperform the F-14 Tomcat and even F-18s, which wasn't an easy task at all. And oh, <laughs> Did I mention that this new fighter jet also had to be VTOL capable, meaning it could take off vertically, and also fly supersonic? Yeah, the stakes were high, but Yukolev was sure that this was their time to shine. Looking back into the past, we can see that the Yak-141 was going to be a huge game changer for the Soviet and then the later on Russian Navy. It would have radically changed how they operated on the high seas for the better. But you don't have to take my word for it when you can test the aircraft yourself in today's video sponsor, War Thunder. Don't fast forward on that timeline because I'm inviting you to come and play with me and fly some of the craziest aircraft ever built in War Thunder, a free online military vehicle combat game. War Thunder features over 2,000 different land, sea and air machines from 1920s to the Cold War that you can fly, drive and cruise to challenge yourself to be better than the aces of the past. My favourite so far being the P400. The Yak-141 is in the latest update, so make sure that you're in the game, that you've done the tutorial in the missions to be ready to fly with me and reconquer the skies in the name of the Soviet Navy. You can play solo missions, or my favourite, in huge air battles with over a hundred different maps. That's right, huge battles that we can all play together. We played a few months ago and it was the most chaos I've ever seen in a match and I can't wait to do it again. I'm still very much a beginner in the game, so you have a great chance to save me from other players. Or if you really want, shoot me down, like everyone else did last time. When you make an account with my link, you'll get a free bonus premium tank, aircraft and ship, as well as a boost to your account. The game's free to play across all platforms, PC, PlayStation and Xbox, and you can cross play with anybody on any other device. So you don't need anything. A keyboard and a mouse on the basic PC will run it. So no excuse to not make an account with my link, do the tutorial and come and play with me next time. It's going to be an absolute blast I know. I'll add the details of how to find each other in the description down below. The first issue with this design was the most obvious one. How the heck do you create a supersonic aircraft capable of vertical landing? Yukolev himself decided to go all in with this project and put the very best engineers on development and a study of feasibility of this design so they could then create an aircraft 
capable of hitting all the right spots with both the government and the navy. You have to remember, by this point in the story, Yukolev had seen what had happened to Sohoi and the other aerospace manufacturers in Russia when it came to politics. They knew that the case study was most likely to change at a whim and they wanted to be prepared as possible. The most interesting part of this new design was the engine, or better yet, engines. The first concepts called for a single engine with a flat thrust vectoring nozzle, similar to what Boeing did on the X-32 down the line, but they scrapped that and decided to go for a much more complicated but also more rewarding system. Now bear with me because this is going to go a little deep dive into engineering. The main engine was the Soyuz R-79B300 after burning turbofan that had an extremely interesting thrust vectoring nozzle. The issue here was how to rotate the nozzle downwards and then back up whilst performing a landing on a deck, and to do it gradually so the pilot wouldn't lose control and the lift engines could provide enough power to have it hover in place over a rolling deck. You can see here that the engineers from the Soyuz Bureau solved this by creating a rotating nozzle segment, which by rotating in the opposite direction, completely changed the flow. And this is exactly how the F-35's Pratt & Whitney F-135 engine works today. But more on that Lockheed connection later. The other engineering problem that they had to solve was the lift engines. They wanted to use just one lift engine separately from the main one, but if that engine failed at any point during the landing, the plane would crash and cause chaos on deck. So instead, they opted for two RD-41 engines, which would provide enough power for hovering. This system was also very good because the lift engines would take cold air from the top of the aircraft and not the hot air which would lead to overheating, which is another problem that the Boeing X-32 had a few decades later. With this design, although very complicated, proved to be very good and gave the Yak-41 great performance in flight. Unfortunately, it was downhill from here. Initially, Yukolev was granted funding for four prototypes and the idea was to have the aircraft in serial production by the end of the 1980s. However, the death of the defense minister, Yustinov, in 1984 and Yukolev's retirement, the program slowed down. They were also waiting for the engine, which was supposed to be ready by the end of 1984. So instead of having a pre-serial production aircraft, they only had their first flight of the Yak-41 by 1987, with a plan for serial production by the early 90s. Flash forward to 1991, and there was a great success with the jet performing its first takeoffs and landings on a carrier deck but this news probably would have been at the back of the local newspaper because the Soviet Union fell apart. The economic shock of this development put an end to many prospective projects throughout the Soviet military, but the Yukolev Bureau was still clinging to their dream and decided to continue on on their own dime testing of the last two flying prototypes before going for state trials. You're probably asking yourself now, why am I saying Yak-41 when the title of this video says Yak-141? Well, there's an interesting piece of trivia behind that. A couple years back during flight testing, 12 world records were set, but the Soviets wanted to keep the aircraft secret. So instead of its real designation, they called it the Yak-141, and it also just became that in the West. It was initially designed as a naval vital jet. During development phase, the requirements were changed. No surprise there, of course. And now the Navy wanted a multi-role aircraft instead, capable of also carrying anti-ship and anti-radar missiles like the KH-31. 
Air-to-air -air missiles would have been from the standard Russian arsenal, such as the R-73s for close and the R-27 for mid to long range, along with the brand new R-77s, superior to their older counterparts. It would also carry two external fuel tanks that could be placed underneath the wings and give it an extended range. It's also interesting to note that the Yak-141 was built using composite materials, some 25% which was new technology for the Soviets and Russians at the time. The radar would have been a pulse Doppler one and maybe even powerful ones initially developed for the MiG-31s in the late 70s. All in all, this would have been one very capable naval jet and a very nice variety of the newest Russian missiles, able to form a great variety of tasks both against air and ground targets. In late 1991, test pilot Yakimov made a hard landing on the deck of the aircraft carrier and the prototype fighter jet caught on fire. Although he ejected in time and survived, this would actually prove to be the nail in the coffin for the project, at least on paper, because the reality was there was simply not enough funds for serial production. The entire team were all working on borrowed time and they probably knew that by the end of the development cycle that they could only fulfill their dream of making this thing actually fly. Funding was cut and production plans abandoned, but Yukolov Bureau found one unlikely and interesting partner to shift all its new technology. It was none other than Lockheed who provided further funding, most likely in exchange for valuable R&D information and experiences with the platform. So the Yak-141 was presented to the public at the Farnborough Airshow in 1992. By 1993, it was shown one last time at the Moscow Air Show, and both prototypes were sent over to the museums where they stand to this day. Lockheed with its X-35 and down the line the F-35 ended up using many of Yakolev's solutions for their aircraft. Although further developed and much superior technologically, it was probably one of the most interesting and frankly unexpected corporations in aviation history. Thank you so much for watching, I hope you enjoyed, and please do check out our Patreon for extra content and early releases. And don't forget to smash that subscribe button like the Pentagon smashed taxpayers dollars in the JTF program. And give this video a like so the algorithm loves us, and leave the comment section on fire. Until the next one.